So now on to today, let me introduce uh, Beatrice. Beatrice de Graff is a distinguished professor and holds the chair of history of the international relations at Utrecht University. Her research focuses on the history of security, conflict, and terrorism, both in the 19th century and in the present day. With her book, Fighting Terror After Napoleon, How Europe Became Secure After 1815, she won the Arnberg Prize for the Best Book in European History in 2022. She is one of the core editors of the Journal for Modern European History for Terrorism and Political Violence and initiated the Security History Network. She is currently working on a sequel to Fighting Terror, dealing with security and empire in 1830. So now I'll clear out of the way and turn it over to Beatrice. So Beatrice, welcome. Thank you so much for the generous introduction, Tom and Christopher. Uh, can you see my PowerPoint already? Sorry, Tom, I can't hear you. Just want to start properly with uh, my PowerPoint in full view. Uh, Beatrice, we have you on, on uh, Zoom and on YouTube, so you are good to go. Thank you. I I had muted and I was closing my PowerPoint and struggling to get back to the screen. Let her let it go. So, <laughs> Thanks. Hortense de Beauharnais, Queen on the Run, Kingmaker Behind the Scenes. That's the title of my talk today. And it's about the beautiful girl that you see in front of you. On April 10. 1783, Hortense Eugenie Cécile Bonaparte was born in Paris. She was born as the second child and first daughter to Alexandre Francois Marie Vicomte de Beauharnais and Josephine Tasche de la Pingerie. She was raised as a free spirit. She only wanted to please her mother and develop her artistic gifts. Yet Hortense found herself in the eye of the revolutionary and the Napoleonic storms that swept over Europe. Called to become queen, she ended up vilified by her husband and dismissed from her duties. It's fascinating that so much, so little has been written about Hortense de Beauharnais. First queen of the Netherlands and true Bonapartist until the bitter end. What there is are most predominantly her own memoirs, few non-scholarly studies in French and a fat tome in Dutch by Tera Coppens, written in a very accessible style, but not based on uh, lots of archival research. Elsewhere, in other historical books, the rumors and slander invented by her husband, Louis Napoleon, reverberate and run through the historical accounts. And for the rest, she's mostly depicted as a tragic princess, a character out of a sometimes even slightly tacky operette. So today, I would like to call Hortensa out from the shadows in which she absconded and showed that she was neither a passive tragic character nor a loose wife or mother. I'd like to restore her dignity and historical agency as kingmaker behind the scenes. As you know, the role of women, noble women in this period, were very much determined by the confines that their society, their class, their men, fathers, brothers, husbands put up. And with Hortense, the fascinating thing is that she was pushed and shoved and pressure, pressurized in many different roles. But the more she was pressed, oppressed, even persecuted, she fought back and fought her way out. So this presentation is for the part of Hortense's youth and queenship in the Netherlands, based on the articles and the monograph of Tera Coppens, and on Hortense's own memoirs, quite lengthy uh, memoirs. For the part of her political role as Bonaparte and kingmaker, I'm drawing on my own new research that I did in the files of the Allied Council, a collective security organization that tried to run Europe after 1814. And I will share with you these thoughts, these findings in a chronological order. Alexandre de Beauharnais had never seen Josephine, who was then still called Rose, before he married her. And when they first met in the port of Brest in France in 1779, they didn't get off at a good pace. Rose Later, Josephine was born in 1763 in Martinique, the French colony of white parents, and was considered a creole. 
After the birth of their son Eugene in 1781, Rose became pregnant for the second time, but her husband believed that uh, didn't didn't want to believe that he was the father of Hortense and demanded a the, the, the divorce. His ex-wife Josephine was forced to retire to a convent, and um, there she tried to win her way back in society. When little Hortense was five years old, Josephine Rose decided to visit her mother on Martinique and she told her she took her infant daughter with her. So Hortense spent her preschool years from five years until 10 years old in paradise on the lovely estate of her grandmother's plantation in Martinique. With her very nice eyes and curls, she garnered the admiration of everyone and she delighted in running around on bare feet, dancing and singing. And here she developed her very musical talents. It was perhaps really the most idyllic time in Hortense's life. And she referred back to it this in her memoirs later on, oftentimes. After the outbreak of a slave revolt in 1793, the mother and daughter had to flee to Paris, where the French Revolution didn't bring much more peace and quiet either into their lives. During the terror, Hortense's father, Alexandre, and mother were imprisoned. Hortense and her little brother Eugene roamed Paris alone. Alexandre was one of the victims who died under the guillotine, but Josephine Rose was set free just before the execution was scheduled to take place. In the meantime, Hortense received a very good education at Madame de Campan's famous girls' boarding school in Paris. And there she learned to play music, dance, drama, painting, and she even received lessons from the famous French painter Jean-Baptiste Isabey. And she excelled in everything. And she even earned quite some prizes and distinctions. For example, bravest child, cleverest child in school. And she was allowed to wear a rose, an art rose, as a distinction. At the same time, her mother used all her charms to gain favors of the new regime. And one day at dinner, she introduced her daughter to a small, somewhat ill-looking general, Napoleon Bonaparte. And then in 1796, Rose definitely changed her name to Josephine and 32 years old married Napoleon. At first, Hortense was not at all pleased. She was angry with the general because he had stolen her mother's heart. And Napoleon wrote to her, you are not very nice, you're a naughty, naughty girl. But if anything, I would like to make you happy as well. Not sure if he did though, although he set out to try. The pictures that you see here are of the time of Hortense at Madame de Campan's uh, education center. And in the middle, it's a very beautiful uh, uh, icon engraved of Josephine and her best friend at the school, Aglai, who later would become the wife to Marshal Ney. Napoleon's star rose rapidly. He returned triumphantly from Italy, ventured to coup d'etat, overthrew the regime and elevated himself to consul and later first consul. Josephine moved in with Napoleon from her home in the Rue de la Victoire to the Pal Palace of Luxembourg and later to the Tuileries. Hortense was summoned from the boarding school to participate in the festivities, the banquets and the reception. So she was now part of the company surrounding Napoleon. And when she reached a marriageable age, Josephine and Napoleon thought that she should marry Louis Bonaparte, Napoleon's younger brother. Their children would join the blood of Bonaparte and Beauharnais. And, still, and since Josephine had not given her husband descendants yet, this allowed her to kind of save her position if her daughter at least would bear children to the, um, the Bonaparte. Hortense was shocked, she didn't want to. She, she was in love with another. And she didn't like the gloomy Louis who bored everyone with his hypochondriac uh, ramifications. But in her heart, she still was the child that wanted to please her mother so dearly and also wanted to be the best child in class. So she agreed against her will. Neither was Louis very much attracted to Hortense, but he too did his duty. And in January 1802, the marriage was consummated. And nine months later, dutifully, Hortense gave birth to her first child, it was a son, and he would be named Napoleon Charles Bonaparte. In December 1804, when Napoleon crowned himself and Josephine Emperor and Empress of France, Hortense was there 
wearing a magnificent empire gown studded with diamonds. She held her son, Napoleon Charles, heir to the Empress throne by the hand. And almost all of Napoleon's brothers and sisters received a crown. And his younger brother, Louis Bonaparte, was to become queen or King of Holland with Hortense, who then gave birth to a second son, Napoleon Louis, in October 1803. When she heard the news, she despaired. Do you really think they're going to send us to Holland? She wrote to her brother Eugene. I cannot think of it without tears springing to my eyes. My God, I will die of grief over it. Well, she almost did. When she first saw The Hague in June 1806, it was, after all, a lovely sight. Her husband sat next to her and the two princes were in the carriage. And uh, newspapers in the Netherlands reported that the beautiful queen was wearing a silk robe, highly decorated with pearls and diamonds. She, Hortense really tried to make the best of it. And indeed, the Dutch people started to love their king. And Louis Bonaparte also loved Holland, which for him was kind of his, his most autonomous position and performance. He could now be loved for himself and show that he really was a king for the Netherlands. But instead of doing this together with Hortense, his marriage for him meant disaster. He was sickly jealous and he didn't like that Hortense in turn was received quite some acclamations herself as well with her new fashion, fashion coming from Paris, the decorations that she tried to introduce in the Netherlands. So he had the queen spied on, he opened her letters, he forbade her to dance. She was no longer allowed to sing and to play the piano in public, which she did so good. And she lived as a prisoner in her apartments. What was even worse, Louis started to spread rumors about the alleged loose morals and love life of his wife. And he demanded from her that she not, not longer accompany him in the festivities, perhaps because he wanted to enjoy the limelight on his own. And then during the thunderous night, of May 4 and 5 in the year 1807, Hortense was struck by a great sorrow. At Huis ten Bos, the little crown prince Napoleon Charles died of croup. Hortense, who sat at his bedside, was taken in shock to her mother in France. and She dared try to regain her strength. King Louis Napoleon, pressurized by his brother, brother, undertook an attempt to save his marriage. He went to France, met his wife and after that encounter, Hortense became pregnant for the third time, but this time Louis had become so paranoid that he did not believe the child was his. And in the Kingdom of Holland, meanwhile, everyone knew about the bad marriage and rumors spread that it was Admiral Verhul who had fathered the child, although he was not there in the vicinity at all. In the meantime, Napoleon had decided to divorce Josephine for the sake of France in 1809. But Napoleon still continued to treat Hortense as his daughter and demanded, you could also say, continue to treat her as his possession, part of his extended family, and demanded that she reconcile with her husband and return to Holland. So unhappily, she came back, this time to Utrecht. This is, by the way, one of the reasons why I am so fascinated by her story, because the history department in Utrecht, where I uh, work, the Drift uh, 6, is directly opposite of the palace, the houses where Josephine uh, took uh, residence in 1809 and 10. And they completely overhauled the decoration. And this still is one of our lecture halls. So I'm always, when I'm wandering there, I look through the windows and see the view that Josephine saw, uh, that Hortense saw as well. By the way, Hortense was not that happy and not that positive about Utrecht. She complained about the smell, the stench, about the fact that the women in Utrecht were very ugly. I leave it at, uh, uh, at, at her opinion there. Hortense was very worse for the wear. She was in fact so weak that citizens who saw her cried, are our poor queen, she's so miserable. Her appearance astonished everyone because, as you may remember, rumors had been spreading that she was living a frivolous life. And now she came back looking very pious, not at all the frivolous women, very much into her religion and very much in mourning for her lost son still. After several weeks, Queen Hortense was so ill that she almost died. And in the summer of 1810, she asked the king, permission to leave. So he reluctantly agreed, but kept their second son with him. 
and then she 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 uh, returned to Plombier to take the baths, and she would never see Holland again because her husband abdicated a month later, and in his palace in Haarlem appointed their eldest son here to heir to the throne, King Louis Napoleon II. The five-year-old was only two weeks on the throne of London, and then. The whole Bonapartist family had to flee the Netherlands and Napoleon, who had annexed Holland to the empire, had him taken to Paris. Napoleon, who had shot up like a comet, was now experiencing, after 1810, his first defeats. The campaign to Russia in 1812 ended in a disaster and the Battle of Leipzig, and at the Battle of Leipzig his troops suffered a crushing defeat. And in 1814 he was finally Fought, defeated, and exiled to the island of Elba. And now, in 1814, it was Tsar Alexander I who called the shots in Paris as head of the invading troops of the Sixth Coalition. The Tsar was himself particularly keen to participate in symbolic acts of reconciliation and to spread a new culture of brotherly love and peace. He released French prisoners of war, he organized the public service of thanksgiving at the Place de la Concorde, and on the spot where Louis XVI was beheaded, the Te Deum was sung and prayer service was jointly conducted. Interestingly enough, the Tsar also made a point of visiting Empress Josephine frequently, to whom he, he took quite a liking, as well as her daughter Hortense, the wife of the then outlawed Louis Bonaparte, the former king of the Netherlands. And he even propped himself up as the advocate for her and her children. So much compassion and generosity shown to a Napoleonide from a new prince, the Romanovs were considered upstarts by the Bourbons. And uh, although the Bonapartes um, uh, were themselves quite new on the stage as well, Tsar Alexander, in the eyes of many French, was just a new, a very new nouveau riche, you could almost say, a character. And this confused Hortense. She wrote, my only support left is an enemy when Alexander came to see her personally and even took her young children on his lap. After all, they were still cousins of Napoleon. When Louis XVIII, the brother of the beheaded Louis XVI, was finally invited to assume the crown, news reached him in Britain and he did not arrive in Paris until the 3rd of May 1814. But all the Deums that were played when he entered the city back in a carriage pulled by eight white horses and accompanied by the thunder of cannons, this could not undo the fact that Tsar Alexander was already quite firmly the man in power there, the man on the spot, and Hortense was his protégé. Alexander therefore was able to secure her a duchy. She was appointed the Duchess of Saint-Leu on the 30th of May 1814 by a disgruntled Louis. Yet when the Allies left France after a couple of weeks in 1814, unrest started to brew again. And after 10 months in exile, you all know about this, Napoleon managed to escape and recaptured his imperial throne and saw Louis fleeing to Ghent. To Ghent. Upon returning to Paris, nothing was the same. Empress Marie-Louise had left France with their son. Josephine had died at Chateau Malmaison on the 29th of May, to Hortense's deepest regret. So during the famous hundred days, it was Hortense who stood by her father like a stepfather, like an empress. But this spell didn't last long. Hortense and her brother supported the emperor with all their might, but he lost his battles. And when he fled to America, tried to fly to America after the Battle of Waterloo, he was captured by the English and exiled to St. Helena. In the summer of 1815, after Waterloo, the French capital was again in turmoil. Rumors whirled like autumn leaves through the crowded streets. Louise Cochelet, the lady in waiting and confidant to Queen Hortense, who also wrote very beautiful memoirs, wrote, Here I am in 1815, a time so magnificent and brilliant and so wretched all at once. The days are so confounding, given the gravity of events and the rapidity with which they are compounded in such a short time. One of the many victims of these turbulences was Louise's friend and employer Hortense. Contrary to the Tsar's advice, Hortense had chosen Napoleon's side during the Hundred Days. Therefore, this time, when he came back in 1815 again, 
the British, the Russian emperor kept his distance. Also because it was now the Prussians and the British who ruled the day. They and King Louise now decided that she had to go. She was now considered a traitor, but also a danger because of the attraction that she exerted on the remaining Bonapartists in the city. On the 17th of July, 1815, the new prefect of police, de Cas, informed Hortense that she had to leave the city within a couple of hours. On behalf of the Allied Council, more on the Allied Council in a minute, Governor Muffling let her know that she must be on her way now even between two hours. Accompanied by Count Eduard de Voina, aide de to get the Austrian General Schwarzenberg, and with a passport stamped by the Allied powers for Switzerland, she left Paris at nine o'clock that same evening. The next day, she was waylaid by a group of unruly British soldiers, and shortly after that, almost arrested by French officers. Her Austrian escort saved her twice, and again, Hortense realized the gravity and the absurdity of the situation. She wrote, enemies taking my part, Frenchmen acting as my foes, for the pleasure of persecuting me, they had placed themselves in a humiliating position and allowed themselves to be reminded that they had to be defeated. So the French were defeated, Hortense was on the run and was now protected by the Austrians. When she arrived in Geneva, she was still harassed. Neither Napoleon, Hortense nor Napoleon's mother who was also expelled to Switzerland, were given permission to stay there. Where to go? Hortense didn't want to go to the Netherlands, because as she very lucidly said, I ruled there once. The French ambassador informed her that she had to wait for orders from the Allied powers. Still, she was escorted, but she was also spied upon, pursued by all sorts of agents and sort of observers, Austrians, Russians, British, British, French even. And in December 1815, she was still traveling through Europe via El Bain and Bern. She finally arrived in the city of Constance in Baden. But there, in her terms, the persecution continued as well. She wrote, a spionage surrounds me on all sides and in every imaginable form. An official indeed at the Baden court informed Hortense that international treaties by the Allied Council did not allow the Baden government to grant a member of the Bonapartist family asylum, and they could only settle in one of the four countries of the what was then called the Quadruple Alliance that had been concluded on the 20th of November 1815. Intensely cold winter weather had come in the meantime, but she and her two little children had to get on their way in the carriage again. Hortense had now become the target of a first series of Allied security measures in peacetime, which I will discuss in a minute. She belonged namely to the first category of Allied enemies, the Bonapartes and their immediate supporters. This was the one side of the threat perception of the Allies. The other side, armed Jacobinism, the revolutionaries, was considered equally threatening. Against this double-faced threat of Bonapartism and armed Jacobinism, the Allied Council decided to take action. So in addition to negotiating a peace treaty, seeing to the demilitarization, the execution of political reforms and payment of reparations, the four great powers decided to occupy France for five or seven years and applied themselves to stabilize and de-Bonapartize France and quell the threat of terror and revolution. How did they do that? Well, interestingly, they did it in a military fashion, economic fashion with reparations, but also in a police fashion. It included quieting the flood of rumors, singling identifying conspiracy plans and apprehending enemies of that state. To that end, the Council devised a series of proactive measures in line with their declared principles of salutary precaution to bring back France and Europe to peaceful habits. These were the four imperatives, the principles that the Allied powers had while occupying France. Setting up hierarchy of powers, stabilizing France, making the French pay, and expanding the scope. And especially the second principle would be very hurtful for Hortense. Because one of the main precautions was to surveil communication and cooperation between all remaining Bonapartists and revolutionaries. 
from the first meetings of the Allied Council in Paris, in the British Embassy, where they convened every second day, the Allied Council discussed in detail that in addition to all military and financial oversight, there needed to be an official Allied police agency. This police agency, intelligence agency, would assist and supervise the Bonapartists, all the enemies, all the perceived enemies, and provided the Allies with information daily. Officials would be put under, French, uh, under Allied supervision regarding political issues. The Council believed that the threat could come from those two corners, as I said, the Bonapartists and from the Système Révolutionnaire. And for them it was intertwined, because with the Système Révolutionnaire, which had put itself on the throne before Napoleon, when Napoleon took over that system, it, the system became even more terrorizing, expanding with the Grande Armée into the countries of Europe. The Prussians tried to convince the other allies that especially the Bonapartists, that they were dangerous. Everything this faction does, the Prussian Chancellor Hardenberg, who was still in Paris, wrote, is focused on trying to undermine us again. We cannot compromise, he wrote. That is why one of the priorities, the second principle, was to stabilize France and to try to prevent uprisings, revolutionaries, radicals, Bonapartists taking over again. How did they do it? As I already said, following the footsteps of Fouché, the famous uh, revolutionary and Napoleonic police minister, Justus von Gruner, um, an uh, officer appointed by the Allied Council, was tasked to set up an Allied intelligence agency. And Gruner gave primary importance both to creating a central registration of public Rumors, public rumors, false gerüchte, he called them, false news, false nouvelles in French, fake news. So Gruner wanted to know on behalf of the Allied Council what kind of rumors run in Paris and beyond, because as they knew since the French Revolution, l'esprit public had toppled a king before, and also Napoleon had been very much aware of the power of public rumor, the public, uh, the esprit public. So he wanted to know what was going on in his capital. And the other thing that was important was to try to um, identify people and make them wear identity cards, passports. This was also a new allied intervention. A, police mo a modern police force needed to have its eyes and ears in the place. At every key crossroad a cafe, Gruner made his agent gauge the political and public temperature of the day. Sometimes they just registered, long live the emperor cries, or long live the young Napoleon. They snapped up political cartoons, diatribes. Sometimes news, fake news was recorded about an army of Turks marching through Europe. Then other rumors held that the Austrian Archduke Karl wanted to put little Napoleon on the throne. And also on Hortense, a lot of the rumors had a um, relation to. Um, there was, for example, a rumor that Tsar Alexander with Hortense again had helped Joseph Bonaparte flee the capital. And on Hortense specifically, uh, there was the rumor that she had helped a number of fugitives faithful to Napoleon, for example, Duhamel, financially by giving them some of their diamonds. In the end, this turned out to be true, so it was not even a fake rumor. Or that she conspired with Napoleon's generals, Exelmans van Damme, to continue the war against the Allies, acting independently, setting up a free corps and conspiring to mobilize a new army to liberate France. Well, these rumors were at the heart of the hunt for Hortense and motivate the Allied ministers to exile her from Paris and put her somewhere as remote and isolated, but at the same time uh, protected and monitored as possible. To that end, she was put on a central blacklist containing a number of people that were considered dangerous to the regime. On the list were terrorists, the ones who voted for the murder of uh, Louis XVI, radicals, revolutionary, and all the members of the Bonapartist clan, clan, the generals and the relatives. And already on the 12th of July, the Allied Council had decided to exile all Napoleon's immediate family, and they were only allowed to live in one of the countries of the Allied, the four major Allied powers, so Russia, Prussia, Britain, or Austria, because only then they felt they could exert control on her. 
And um, all these members also had to bear passports with them. And on these passports, it was inscribed that they were put on the blacklist. This issue of passports was, by the way, very much an idea of Metternich, because he felt that only with a passport he could keep track of his um, suspects roaming through Europe. And he could then also decide where and how and by whom they were um, um, granted asylum. According to Metternich, only those countries of the Allied uh, Quadruple Alliance had adequate security infrastructures and were powerful enough to effectively supervise those exiles. Many of the exiles went into the Netherlands, though, into Italy or Switzerland, because uh, they had, rightly so, the feeling that these countries were more liberal. And this proved to be a constant bone of contention between the new kings of those countries and the Allied Council. So, for example, after conferring with the French government, it was decided that uh, Joseph and Jerome and Hortense and Napoleon's mother all had to leave the country. So where did Hortense end up in the end? Hortense de Boanne, Napoleon's loyal stepdaughter, was one of the first affected by these new Allied security arrangements. As I already told you, on the 17th of July, 12, five days after these provisions were made, she had to leave her country. In August, the Allied Council met to discuss her case again, because she was still roaming through Europe. She was part of the network of Napoleonid, included under the, under the category of dangerous persons, and uh, although the degree of culpability was determined individually, Hortense's case was complex and was brought up at several meetings. As a single mother, she lived separated from her husband, Louis Bonaparte. On the one hand, she did not seem capable of doing much harm. On the other hand, however, she had remained loyal to Napoleon to the bitter end and was associated, sometimes even rightly so, with all kinds of Bonapartist intrigues. That is why the Allied Council politely but bindingly advised her to settle in one of those four countries of the Allies, purported also with an eye on her safety. Although, if she really wanted to stay in Switzerland, where she was at that time, that could be acceptable, but only as a way of an exception and as a temporary solution. She would have to be tailed closely. She had to accept that she was being spied upon all the way and be put under so-called allied protection. In fact, that meant that she was placed under legal guardianship and tutelage of the powers. Her freedom was limited and conditional. And the same happened for the other uh, relatives of Napoleon, Jerome, was allowed to stay in Württemberg. Lucien was granted asylum in Rome, as was Louis Bonaparte, Murat and Joseph would eventually be granted asylum in Austria. And Tsar Alexander suggested that the entire family should come and settle in his and Lefran. He would have a couple of cities where they could live their uh, uh, life quiet and peacefully, but none of the Bonapartes felt at all inclined to take up that offer to move to Russia. Via the King of Württemberg, the Allied Council received a contract of sorts signed by Jerome Bonaparte. And in this letter, Napoleon's brother promised on his word of honor to abide by the stipulation. So this is the archive trail that this monitoring situation left behind. I haven't been able to find such a contract uh, signed by Hortense, but uh, there are plenty of surveillance reports on her movements uh, there. Still, Metternich was uneasy about it, and he tried to keep bringing it up, and he felt that Hortense in Switzerland was too uh, instable a situation. She could have too much freedom and leeway there. Indeed, Hortense was considered a pivotal figure. The cheering from faithful Bonapartists that accompanied her coach along the roads in France spoke volumes, and the Austrian soldiers had written about it. What was more, Hortense maintained contact with Ney's widow, Aglaé, and did indeed offer financial support to family of Bonapartist generals, such as Duhamel, who was in prison. She also stayed in contact with Count de la Vallette, who ended up staying with Hortense's brother, Eugene, in Bavaria. During those first Napoleonic years, the song that Hortense composed, Partant pour la Syrie, Syrie, remained very popular. It was a notorious Napoleonic battle song composed by Hortense for her stepfather. And according to police chief Gruner, it was sung and whistled all day long in the streets of Paris. 
That is why Metternich, at the end of 1815, invited Hortense to, as he wrote it, avail herself of Austrian hospitality. Yet, pressurized in this direction, Hortense refused. And she said, I'm preferring an uneasy freedom in Constant to a protective prison under Metternich's curatorship. There and then, in the mountains of Switzerland, Hortense sought to escape the rumors and suspicions and come to terms with her unrest. During a visit to a Benedictine monastery in the village of Einsiedeln, she received consolation and blessings from a priest and concluded that her, in her words, her own pride and vanity had been her greatest enemies. In gratitude, she gave the monastery a few of her remaining diamonds. And then in 1817, with what remained of her fortune, after endless negotiations with Metternich and the like, she was allowed to buy a small chateau near Constance, Schloss Arenenberg, on the southern shore of Lower Lake Constance, just inside the border of the, to her mind, more independent and safer Switzerland. So after various wanderings, Augsburg, Rome, Britain and France, she was finally allowed to move into her own place. And that place then became a hotbed for radical entertainment, a meeting place for writers, philosophers, royalists, Bonapartist nobility. Given a musical cultural interest, Chateaubriand was just as welcome as her brother Eugene. There, she also began to write her memoirs to defend herself against the slander that had spread about her internationally. Her home became a focal point of French culture and exile. She composed and published, drew and painted. Franz Liszt played her piano, the young bride Alexandre Dumas lay at her feet, and even the poet Lord Byron came to stay with her. But what was more important, she kept the spirit of resistance against the restoration regimes alive and raised her sons to be staunch Bonapartists. Louis Napoleon's tutor there was Philippe Le Bas, an ardent Republican and the son of a revolutionary. He used to be a close friend of Robespierre. Louis Napoleon was taught French history, radical politics. Hortense also took Louis Napoleon to Rome when he was 15, where the other Bonapartists lived. There he learned Italian, became a good friend to Chateaubriand, and reunited with his older brother Napoleon Louis, who at that moment lived there with uh, uh, his father. In the 1820s, both boys became involved with the Carbonari, secret revolutionary societies fighting Austria's domination in northern Italy. And then, unfortunately, in the spring 1831, when he was 23, um, the Austrian uh, and papal governments launched an offensive against the Carbonari. Two brothers wanted by the police were forced to flee. And during the flight, the second son, Napoleon Louis, contracted measles. He died in his brother's arms on the 17th of March 1831. Hortense was just in time to join her son, and together they evaded the police and Austrian army and reached the French border. There, Hortense and Napoleon in 1831 traveled incognito to Paris, where the old regime of the Bourbons had been fallen, replaced by a more liberal regime of King Louis Philippe, the monarch of the July monarchy. When the presence of Hortense and Louis Napoleon in the hotel became known, large crowds gathered in front of the palace, organizing public demonstrations of mourning for the old emperor, Napoleon. Again, Hortense was a magnet, a pivot in the Bonapartist networks. At that point, Louis Philip had enough and he ordered Hortense and Louis Napoleon to go back to their castle in Arenenberg. Ever since the fall of Napoleon 1815, that's what this demonstrates, a Bonapartist movement had existed in France, hoping desiring a return of a Bonaparte to the throne. And according to the law of succession established by Napoleon I, the claim first passed to his own son, the King of Rome. Uh, this heir, known by Bonaparte as Napoleon II, was living at the court of Vienna under the title the Duke of Reichstadt. Next in line was Napoleon's eldest brother, Joseph, and then Louis Bonaparte. But neither Joseph nor Louis had an interest in re-entering public life. So when the Duke of Reichstadt died in 1832, Charles Louis Napoleon, Louis Napoleon became the de facto heir of the dynasty and the leader of the Bonapartist cause. And indeed, in exile with his mother in Switzerland, he enrolled in the Swiss army, trained to become an officer, wrote a manual of artillery. He knew very well that his uncle Napoleon had become famous as a military man. But he also wrote about political philosophy. And he developed, perhaps also in discussions with Hortense, a strange doctrine combining universal principles, such as universal suffrage, with a primacy of national interest and glory for France. 
he called for a monarchy which procures the advantage of the Republic without the inconveniences, a regime strong with despotism, free without anarchy. In 1837, Hortense fell ill while Louis Napoleon was traveling the world, meeting elites in London, Basel, New York. He reached Arenberg just in time to be with his mother, and there Hortense succumbed to uterine cancer on the 5th of August, 1837, only 54 years old. She was buried in Rai in France next to her mother in 1838, but Louis Napoleon was not allowed to attend. Dutch newspapers devoted only three lines to the death and funeral of their first uh, queen. According to her last wishes, her remains were indeed thus transferred to Rai, but then her youngest son inherited her ambition and power of the Bonapartist and returned to Paris 10 years later during the French Revolution of 1848 and with an overwhelming majority of 74% was elected president of the Second Republic in December only to usher in a second empire in 1852 with himself being crowned as Emperor Napoleon III on the 2nd of December 1815. Two. And as a national anthem, he chose the most beloved song composed by his mother. Well, it was the informal anthem, not the Marseillais, but um, uh, the informal one was Partir pour, Partant pour la uh, Syrie. So, coming to an end now. Hortense was pushed and shoved as a pawn in the power games of her father, of Napoleon, her husband, and after 1813, as a target of the Allied security arrangements. However, none of these maneuvers succeeded in breaking her. One could even say that the unintended consequence of her exile was that she took the spirit of Bonapartism and patriotic resistance with her, instilled it in her children, and despite or even because of the Allied surveillance, managed to create in Switzerland the hub of a network of liberal patriots and freedom fighters against the backdrop of Allied security measures, uniform passport procedures, surveillance, censorship, banishment, Hortense only received more acclaim and support. A castle in Arenenberg became a hotbed of literary excitement, radicalization. Blacklisted persons, radicals, exiles found a way to her salon. But her sons joining the Carbonari and fighting along Italian rad radicals, she became the greatest spiritist rector of this new creed of Bonapartism that would run France once more in 1852, losing two sons, raising another to become emperor, and another fourth illegitimate son to become one of the supporters of that emperor, her role, Hortense's role, surely should be seen not as a puppet, not as a tragic princess, but that as a kingmaker behind the scenes. And please allow me to conclude this presentation with the song that she composed, and I hope that you're able to Listen to it. It's not coming through very clearly, Beatrice. So good. I'm now hearing that it's not coming through very clearly. No, so, so I I'll try it from my desktop, if you want to stop sharing. And then if that doesn't work, then I will put the YouTube link into yes, the, the comment afterwards. So let's see. Can you hear that? No. Okay. Very weakly. So I think you're right. Perhaps the people should uh, look it up themselves. It's unfortunately, yeah. No, no problem. So it will be in the comment. At, at, uh, I'll post it in the comments at the close of the talk, and you can follow the link there itself. But at this point, uh, Chris, if you can start bringing forward questions and we'll wrap this up with, with a Q&A. That, that was an outstanding and, and fascinating presentation, Beatrice. Uh, I just had no idea. So I loved it. So that's perfect. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, as Tom said, um, a lot of uh, 
very new information for uh, for us over here. Um, before uh, we get, uh, we do have some questions. Before we get to them, I'm wondering if you can uh, perhaps now or at the end uh, mention your book, which I am um, enjoyedly right in the middle of uh, about the, learning about the Allied Security Council after 1815. So maybe you could just mention that or uh, uh, the title or or where to where to get it. Yes, that's very nice of you. Thank you. Can you see my presentation again? Uh, yes, you're in uh, slide sorter mode. Yes, and uh, to the right of this slide, you can see it, Fighting Terror After Napoleon, How Europe Became Secure After 1815 uh, at Cambridge University Press. It was published in 2020. And uh, yeah, very happy to share that with you. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll post a link for that as well, too, in the comments. Thank you. So. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So a few questions about uh, Hortense herself and then um, sort of a couple on more allied security in general, which I know is, is uh, one of your um, your areas of expertise. So, um, but um, I wonder if, um, I, I think you, you address this question a little bit, but um, especially after 1815, when uh, Hortense is in Switzerland, is she as dangerous as the Allied Security Council thinks she is? Does, or is she, um, is it more sort of nostalgia, people gathering there um, to sort of reminisce about Napoleon and, and, and the greatness of France, or is she actually dangerous? At, at, at that time do you think well that that's a very good question and it ties in with um the question on how dangerous was the threat of terror revolution and radicalism really after 1815 and you know that adam zamoyski the famous polish historian wrote a phantom terror book where he said it's just all nonsense it was fake news and it was used those those messages and those rumors to beef up an allied security apparatus and to bolster the restoration regimes and none of it was really true it was just to implement especially um well of course Samoyski as, as, as a, a descending from a Polish noble family had, has, has all reasons to be quite angry with horrible alliance because they took away autonomy of Poland. So he says they only did that and uh, with a suggestion that there was a revolutionary threat, but that threat had vanished at all after 1815. Well, that's one position. Um, then there's the, the position, of course, of the Allied ministers with their blacklists and their passports and their surveillance, which is quite modern, um, uh, actually, who saw the revolution room, looming around the corridor once more. Uh, and I think that's equally um, uh, exaggerated. My position is a bit in between and has also much more to do with... with a trajectory of, of radicalization, a trajectory of perceptions. I mean, in 1815, Hortense was just a tragic princess on the run with two little children. But when she was there in Switzerland, she was herself kind of hardened by what she had experienced, by the fact that she had to leave, that they saw her as this threat. And then she was still a mother raising at least one son. Uh, and she tried to, to, to give their sons all the hatred, the, the rejection of the restoration regimes and raise them as true Bonapartists. And she could have decided to how do you say, be more moderate, uh, uh, integrate herself more into the fold? She didn't need to have supported Napoleon the second time. So she constantly, persistently took turnings in her life where she did go against the grain. She didn't go with the powers that be, but she supported the Bonapartist um, uh, family and uh, she went along with them. And I think for her, uh, giving that to her sons was perhaps her real dedication in life and made her in the end indeed dangerous in the eyes of the allies because indeed she was the one who propped up napoleon iii to become a new emperor of france and then of course it de de um, depends on whether you see that as a threat or not but you could say, say that a descendant of the bonapartist was not a loyal member of the quadruple alliance was not one for the balance of power but it was one for running uh, um, europe as a hegemon so a bit of a complicated answer, but it's not that clear cut. Sorry. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. Like uh, every good answer in, in history is either it depends or, or both, right? Um, so a, a related uh, almost follow-up question that uh, somebody just posted in the chat. Were there uh, other women given a similar treatment as Hortense? Um, and how does her treatment by the Allied Security Council compare to uh, men that were blacklisted? Was it, was it very similar or was she given um, additional or, or special treatment? Yes, well, it was still a, a very courteous era and she was a princess, a noble woman. So she was treated with all kinds of respect, with escort. But as she said, it's an, an it's a prison kind of protection. And she was treated similar to Joseph and Jerome and Louis, although Louis was far more in the background. You could say that the other woman was Napoleon's mother himself, but she was older and ailing. So for the Allies, um, Hortense was dangerous because she had... A potential heir to the throne in her trail. So that made her, that made Metternich, for example, far more wary about her. And also because he knew that with her charisma, uh, she attracted quite a lot of people to her castle, much more so than, for example, Jerome did. So I think she received similar treatment to the men. She was singular and being the one prominent woman, woman on the list, and she was considered a dynastic threat to the Bonapartist threat, which she continued on. And her husband, a strange husband, Louis Bonaparte, he didn't make much of how did it. There was one attempt, a letter that he wrote to the Dutch, uh, to the Dutch um, parliament, I think, where he said, well, if you would like to have me, I could become your king again. But um, that letter was never responded to. And then he let it go and he retired to Italy, where he took up a new love life with a far much younger mistress and um, enjoyed his life as a private person till the end. So uh, Hortense was far more political than her husband. Interesting. Um, so one um, one very specific question before we get on to some uh, maybe one or two more general um, Security Council questions. Uh, so uh, Noah says that um, he was very surprised uh, when you mentioned uh, Chateaubriand as uh, calling on Hortense. Um, and so what do you think the draw is for um, staunch anti-Bonapartists to visit Hortense. And, and I'm sort of picturing uh, a similar case to people visiting Napoleon in exile. Um, what, what was the draw there? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I'm, I'm trying to look into that myself as well. Uh, why Chateaubriand felt so attracted to her. I think partly Chateaubriand was a very effervescent, a very um, curious character. I also wanted to know what was going on. And he had a keen eye for literature, for texts, for talent. And uh, Hortense was, we shouldn't forget about that. She was very talented. She was very musical. She started to publish uh, musical romances, musical pieces uh, in the 1820s that were quite enjoyable. As I, as I said, the Partan pour la Cité Syrie was her composition. So she was had a talent of her own and Chateaubriand just loved talented women, talented people. Um, we should also bear in mind that the Bonapartists were not really revolutionary radicals. Uh, they could be quite conservative. And I think what joined the two of them was the strive, the desire to make France great again, huh? the, the, the glory of France, which was also something that Chateaubriand was very much interested in. And it went even further when uh, Chateaubriand was in Rome as an ambassador. Um, uh, he befriended himself with Louis Napoleon. So Obviously, Chateaubriand had a feeling, had a sympathy for the Bonapartist family, which is strange, strange as it is. It, it, it's worthwhile looking into that in more detail. So again, a very multifaceted answer. <laughs> Certainly no, no simple answer to that one either. And uh, probably uh, on that theme, one of the, the biggest questions we had, um, which I, I'm sure could be um, an entirely different lecture, um, but um, somebody earlier was asking about the Allied Security Council and NATO today, and if you see sort of a link between them, and, and does NATO, is sort of NATO the modern version of the 1815 Allied Security Council? And I, I know that, that that's a math question, and that, um, that's sort of one of your main areas of study, but maybe you can um, give us a a synopsis of, of that research. 
Oh, I love the question. Thanks to the person who asked it. Um, well, fascinating as it was, when I started my research into the Allied Commission um, in, I think it's now, what is it, 2016 or so? And, uh, as you do when you're starting just Googling things, Allied Commission, Allied Machine. And, uh, well, of course, first you find lots of, of, of references to the Allied Council of 1945, which was in the, indeed one of the, you could say, pre platform free runner to NATO without Russians. There's also an Allied Commission uh, after 1918, um, uh, the, um, the Peace of Versailles uh, that was being negotiated there, and that also fed into the League of Nations. So there's, there's a genealogy there as well. But then this Allied Council popped up that convened in 1815 and it concluded the Quadruple Alliance Treaty, Prussia, Russia, uh, Britain and Austria. And in 1818, France was invited back into that uh, alliance as well. So yeah, you could say those, those that alliance still contains the powers of Europe that are quite prominent today. Um, fascinating enough, and in divergence from NATO, the Quadruple Alliance both run external foreign military uh, security operations and domestic. It also impacted on domestic espionage. It had this allied police security agency, and there was discussion about it because the British felt very awkward, very um, ill about this, and they terminated uh, their participation in this in 1818, 1819. But the idea, and but Metternich continued with the cause by the Beschluss, so there was still some kind of European security uh, arrangement that allowed for communication, um, surveillance together. So you could say there, the, the 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 predecessor, sorry, the successor organization may rather be Europol and Interpol than NATO, or perhaps the EU to some to some extent, because NATO very clearly doesn't have an, a domestic uh, a espionage uh, mission or, or um, competence at all. It's prohibited for NATO to, to do politics. Right. So, uh, like I say, a fascinating topic that could be, um, I, I know uh, the last time we had you on, we spoke about the, the connection between 1815 and 1918. And, and this is just sort of expanding on that theme, but um, absolutely fascinating topic. So uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to say to our audience, unfortunately, we um, I think we had a couple more questions, but um, we, we do have to cut it off there because I know you have to run and Tom and I have another lecture to set up for. But thank you so much. This, this was fascinating. As Tom said, um, a topic that um, we, we didn't know much about and it was fascinating to learn. So I'm going to turn it back over to Tom, but thank you so much. Thank you, Christopher. And I also want to underscore that I like the fact that women on the international stage in the arena are also allowed in in your conference. Not just as speakers, but also as characters. So thank you for that. Yeah. Well, we, we strive for diversity. So it, it, it this really complemented uh, our planned program. So it was fantastic. Uh, so to recap, I will put the link to the song, um, some information about Beatrice's book, and then also a link to the previous talk she did for us uh, around uh, the, the Allied Council. So there's a lot of good supporting information there as well. So uh, for our audience, we're back in about one hour with Andrew Field talking about the Prince of Orange. Join us live or, or come back, check out the channel, and you can see the recording there. Uh, two more talks this afternoon. And please uh, remember to subscribe. We really appreciate your help and support. So thank you, everyone.